Here I uh, never hear the the passage Matthew seven without thinking about a time. And there's a guy in our church. He stopped coming for a while, but he would still communicate with me on uh, just texting and stuff like that. He actually passed away here a while back. Older guy. He was, he was a Vietnam vet, and uh, just it's kind of a long story. I'll tell you more about that guy sometime. But I'll never forget the time uh, I was preaching on addictions. Right, so I was mentioning these different addictions, and I talked about addictions that I struggled with, uh, that I still struggle with to this day. And then I mentioned some weird addictions that nobody in the church probably struggles with. I mean, you know, they're out there. There's some weird stuff. People eat some uh, eat some weird things, and stuff. <laughs> but uh, we won't go into that. But uh, and and I was just preaching on that subject. And then yes, I came across some of the more common ones people are addicted to, and smoking was one of the ones I I hit on. Well, I knew that this guy had a problem smoking and his psychiatrist, you know, because of PTSD and whatever from Vietnam, I mean, way back then, he, his psychiatrist actually told him, well, you need, you need to smoke. It relieves your, it calms your nerves and all that. And so you need to go ahead and smoke. So anyway, I got done preaching that message and on his way out, you know, he, I considered him a friend. We got along really well. He, he liked us for some reason and, our, and, uh, and I liked him. Uh, he, he always smelled like smoke. I know that. But on the way out, he just looked at me and he, he kind of leaned over like he's going to tell me something. He said, read Matthew 7. And then he walked out like that was some profound thing. Like Jesus is going to tear down everything that I just preached by saying, read Matthew 7. And you know what he means, read Matthew 7 verse 1. <laughs> judge not that you be not judged. And I'm thinking, man, I just preached in that message that I have things that I struggle with and everybody has things that they struggle with. It doesn't say don't judge anybody. It says don't judge particular things that you're struggling with. That's the idea. Don't, don't, you know, you try to get, uh, uh, something out of your brother, a moat out of your brother's eye when you have a beam out of your own eye. I mean, that's the picture that's, that's right there. And so like one of the applications from this chapter is certainly this whole idea of judging and saying, basically, you know, you stay just messing, just dealing with your own life and dealing with your the things that you have uh, the potential and the ability to change and don't worry about, about other people. But that doesn't mean like there's never a time to recognize when someone's doing something wrong or whatever. But anyway, that's not really the main uh, place that I want to go to tonight, uh, this afternoon. What I want to go to is verse 13 and 14. Familiar passage, it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, if you read uh, in Luke's account, I think it's Luke 8, uh, when he's telling the story, he's got the disciples saying, Lord, are there few that be saved? And then he begins to tell this. So there seems to be an application where he's saying, look, there are few people that are going to be saved in the, you know, if you, in, 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 if you weigh it out, you know, there's a lot fewer people that are going to be saved than all the masses. Anyway, that makes, that makes sense. But the, the application is the tricky part because some people will say, you know, the road to eternal life is hard. You know, and it's narrow and it's only a few get in as if depending upon our works and our effort. And we know that that's not true. The application could be made that there's only one way to get to heaven. That's pretty narrow, isn't there? That's Jesus Christ. You know, he's the only way, the truth and life. No man comes unto the Father but by him. That's pretty narrow. And so there are some applications that can be made by that. But not only that, there is an application, I believe, for Christians to just look at this and say that there is a road if you will, the Christian path, the Christian lifestyle, the, the you know, that is going to be a narrow road. And when we think about that, that's kind of where I want to go. Uh, I'm not going to stick with the with the text here. I'm going to do it the old fashioned by uh, old fashioned Baptist way and depart from <laughs> from my uh, from my text here. <clears throat> but if you think about this idea of there being a road in our Christian life, and we got to stay on this road, don't get the idea that what I mean by this is that we're going to look for some easy, comfy road. You know what I mean? Like uh, we just had, uh, you know, all this, I don't know how long it's going to be that we have a detour on the way between here and Iola. Uh, but man, for over a year now, we've had this detour. We have to take these side roads and everything to get here. And, you know, as they open up a little bit of the road that they've worked on, 
you know, you, you no longer have to drive in those potholes in the, in, the, in the gravel and all this stuff that we're driving on. You have a nice, smooth, you know, they've widened the lanes. And uh, it's kind of funny because when we go on that, you know, we notice every little bump because it's, it's really smooth. And you notice a little bump. You're like, I thought they worked on this. It's like, that's, that's really just not really, that's just a tiny little bump, right? <laughs> we got it pretty easy. That's a whole lot better than the potholes and the gravel and all that you'd have to drive on. This is a nice road and it's, it's straight shot. It's comfy. You don't have to worry about, you know, uh, hitting anything or, or whatever. And so, uh, you know, sometimes we think that the road that we're on in our life, like we want it to be just completely smooth, you know, no turns, no, uh, you know, potholes or anything like that. But that's not what we're talking about, because the Christian, the Christian path or the Christian life is going to get really narrow sometimes. It's going to have lots of zigzags. It's going to, it's going to lean sometimes. It's going to have potholes. There's a lot of obstacles in the way. It's not an easy path. It's a, it's a difficult path. And if you read any verse where Jesus is talking about discipleship and he's talking to his disciples and saying, you know, take up your cross and follow me or all the different things he tells them to the disciples, uh, you know, you got to give up everything, <laughs> you know, uh, you got to hate your, your mother and your father and all that. And we know the context of there. Uh, obviously, we're supposed to love our, our parents, but it's talking about, you know, you love the Lord so much and you're following him that sometimes it's going to put you at variance between your even family members or whatever. But but part of following God is being able to give up all that. And, and, and anyway, there's, it's, it's tough. And I don't know how anybody could read that and think like, well, that's salvation. Because that would be so, uh, you know, so different and opposed to, contradictory to everything the Bible says about salvation. Because it's not based on our works. But following the Lord, is that takes a lot of work. That takes a lot of hard roads and taking those, uh, those difficult roads to take. So I'm definitely not saying at all that we want to look for the wide road or the easy path or, uh, or that we just want to avoid uh, you know, any obstacles. But what I want to talk about in this message is that what we do want to avoid is falling into the ditch. Okay, And the title of the message is The Ditch on Both Sides. Like if, if you're on a road, picture this, all, most roads have it this way, see a lot of roads where there's a ditch. You don't want to fall into the ditch on this side, right? But there's also a ditch on this side and you don't want to, uh, you know, fall in either side. And so uh, this is this is the idea. Now, I'm in a situation, I, I've taught one uh, of my teenagers how to drive and I'm in the process of teaching the others. And what you, if you've never been through that, you know, one thing that you're constantly doing is, is thinking, okay, you're getting a little too close to the side of the road. Like, you know, you, your, your wheel is like right on the edge. Okay. So you need to get over a little, no, no, not that too much. You're going into the other lane. No, no, you have to come out. And you know what I'm saying? You're just constantly like, no, you need to keep it in between, <laughs> in between these, you know, the idea is to keep, you know, don't go too far that way. That could be a wreck and don't go too far that way, or you could uh, end up in the ditch. Okay. Uh, so this is a is a common thing. Now let me say this: if you had to choose one or the other, all right. Let's just say we're going to go on the safe side. I don't know what else to do. I'm going to have to choose one or the other. Would you go off into the ditch, or would you go into the road where the semis come and head on? <laughs> right. I would go into the ditch, you know, because there's a lot less. I mean, there's a greater potential that I'm going to survive. Nobody's going to get hurt. Uh, but let's be honest. I don't want to go in the ditch. That's going to be expensive. I'm going to have to fix the car. Possibility somebody still will get hurt. But you understand, like, if you had to make a choice, I'd rather go on the side of the road than go into the other lane and get hit, you know. Or if the one's like a little ditch and the other one's like a drop off, you know, in the Mount, uh, Rocky Mountains or something like that, I'm staying away from that drop off and I'm going to hug the ditch on the other side to be on the safe side. OK, so so, uh, you know, I, I believe you got to do your best either way to stay out of the ditch. That's the point. Going in the Christian life uh, is, you know, trying to figure out how to just stay on that road and not go too far. Uh, to the That's the idea of this message. Okay. And let me give you a quick disclaimer before I give the uh, couple of points on this subject is that anytime we're talking about extremes, you know, I do this a lot when we talk about standards, standards of dress, standards of music, standard, whatever, 
you know, I usually try to think about extremes. Like, you know, what is, we know going this, going too far this way would be wrong. We know going too far this way would be wrong. And so we're somewhere in the middle. Here's the danger of that is, is who gets to dictate what the extremes are. You know what I mean? And so what we got to be really careful about, and I want to be careful about in this message, is not to make myself the standard. Does that make sense? Be like, no, 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 this is what the perfect road looks like, and that way's a ditch, and that way's a ditch. Well, who gets to decide that, right? Who gets to decide that? Well, for, based on the content of the message, this is what decides, you know, what that is. But sometimes, let's be honest, we, we don't see super clearly. We didn't, we didn't know that that road was going to turn that fast. We didn't understand. It was kind of foggy. We didn't see it. And sometimes we're going to get on right on the edge of falling off, a, 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 off into a ditch or or something like that. And so I don't want to make myself up as a standard say everything I do and everything I believe and everything I is exactly right. But there's some things we can look at the Bible and say, well, we know that's right. And we could say, you know what I mean? If I have to choose between the two, one extreme or the other, I'm going to go this side because it's a little safer. But that's not saying I want to stay out of danger because sometimes a Christian road takes you right into danger. <laughs> And even if you stay on the road, you're still in a dangerous spot. I hope all that makes sense. I, I, I kind of go overboard on disclaimers sometimes, but that's just kind of how I do. So there's a ditch on both sides. Let me just talk about three simple things. I could, I, we could go on for hours and talk about uh, lots of different things, but I want to talk about some of the main things when it comes to the ministry, okay? And particularly things that might uh, relate to, to our ministry here. So number one, preaching the gospel. Okay, preaching the gospel. Now, I would say that there is an extreme on both sides, and I'm going to use these words and then I'll explain it. But you've heard this before. This is what everybody always says. You've got easy believism on one side and you've got lordship salvation on the other side. I, I take that a step further and say you've got, you know, because it, it depends on how you define easy believism. That's probably the middle of the road, right? But the way that some people define that is what I would call easy professism, right? <laughs> or easy prayism or something like that, where you just give somebody a couple facts, lead them in a prayer and say, oh, they got saved and you didn't really give them the gospel. You don't really know that they saved. I can, I can understand that. If somebody's saying, hey, that's an extreme, I would agree with that, okay? And then the other extreme, I'm just going to say, I'm going to go a step further from lordship salvation and just say works-based salvation. Okay, that would be an extreme saying that a person has to depend on how good they are, uh, you know, how much they can turn from their sins and clean up their life or anything along those lines where they're depending on themselves to get saved. That's an extreme. That's that's a damnable heresy to teach them that they have to rely on their works uh, to get saved. So that's definitely uh, in a ditch. And sometimes it's hard to identify exactly when a person crosses that line, all right? Now, to some, they think they got it figured out. I, I know what that line is, okay? But I've talked to people who say, for instance, they use the word repent, and that doesn't necessarily mean what, you know, some people might read into that and think that it means. And so you have to listen to what they're saying. You got to kind of uh, uh, figure that out. And, uh, and when you're deciding where that road is and what you're going to stay on on that narrow road, you know, you've got to think in terms of, uh, of these extremes, okay? So let me give you an example. Uh, I may have mentioned this last week or on Thursday. I think I mentioned it a little bit on Thursday. But somebody uh, had reached out to me, and it was somebody who uh, they stopped um, running around the circles that we do. Let's just put it that way. And, and some things happened. They got offended, called out on some areas treated badly. I believe they were, they were treated badly. They did some things that, you know, I, I think that they shouldn't have done that kind of, kind of led to that. And, uh, uh you say, well, why don't you call out names and be specific? It's, it's not going to help anybody to do that right now. That's so just, that's why I'm doing, it. I can talk to you about more details afterwards, but, uh, it won't help anybody to just to say names and make a big deal. But somebody contacted me and they've been upset for some for some time about, you know, like if we have a soul winning event, all the people that would come to that soul winning, uh, soul winning event, like we pretty much all agree, I think, on how to lead somebody to the Lord. Right. But because of 
preachers that these guys listen to or whatever, I, I feel like that this person that contacted me has gotten so bitter and he's got resentment and kind of like disillusioned by that whole this whole movement or whatever that he says, you know, I've just totally left that. He was encouraging me. I think you need to take a, make a clean break. And I, I talked about that a little bit on Thursday. And, uh, and he was saying, you know, this, he, he, he was talking about all these things. And then we got into soul winning, okay? Maybe this is how the conversation even started. I can't remember. <clears throat> but his terminology as he was talking to me, now I, we could talk a little bit more and I could figure out exactly what he's saying, but his terminology led me to believe that he got disillusioned and he got upset, he got bitter about the way we were preaching the gospel, the, the way we are used, we're accustomed to that. And so he kind of went the other extreme, and now it's, I feel like he's leaning more towards, well, you know what? Now that I think about it, there's you know a big push you know to get numbers on the board, and everybody's like going out, and I don't really know if they are really getting saved, and you know maybe we need to push more about preaching against sin, and maybe we don't need to lead them in prayer, maybe we just need to preach the gospel and and, and talk about repentance and and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, whoa, man, you're just going down that wrong extreme because now what you're going to do is you're going to start saying, well, you know what, we don't want to lead anyone to the Lord. We just want to... you could go lots of different ditches in that way. You can go into Calvinism. You can go into, you know, works-based salvation. You can go to all these. And I fear that you got into that ditch because you were swerving from the other ditch. Does that make, does that make sense? So like I remember uh, uh, years ago when I first started uh, seeing Valerie, Dayton Valerie, I was in my truck and I worked UPS overnight and, uh, and I don't know, it was probably like four o'clock in the morning, got off work. I was driving down to meet her and, uh, I'm on the road. And before I know it, I, I mean, I just, I knew I was tired, but I thought I'd be okay. I thought I'd be able to make it. But before I know it, I wake up and I feel that I'm in, I'm in the grass, driving in the grass. A lot of you, a lot of you guys probably been there before and you're in the grass. And I freaked out cause I was on the highway and now I'm in the grass and I realized the highway's over there. So what do you think I did? Ah, like that, right? So what happened was I ended up on the other side of the road wrapped around a guardrail. <laughs> you know, the grass really wasn't hurting me. I could have just pulled right back on and got back on the road. But because I freaked out and swerved, I ended up wrecking into the guardrail. And I fear, like, I fear that sometimes that's what we do when something causes us, whether it's bitterness, resentment, or just some kind of, you know, some kind of trial or whatever comes and we're just like, no, I'm just going to take it back, everything. <laughs> I don't, I'm just going to like start believing something else. And, and we swerve and we, and we go too far the other way. And it, of the two, right now, what I believe everybody in here is saved, knows how, knows how to lead somebody to the Lord or knows what salvation is. If, I, if we went around the room and, and asked, you know, just picked people randomly, how do you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? I feel like everybody would know the answer to that. And I feel like it's genuine and everybody in here is saved. But let me ask you this. In, when it comes to preaching the gospel, if, if easy believism or easy prayerism or whatever you want to call it, right, could be an extreme, right? That could be an extreme where somebody just goes, maybe quote a verse, you know, have a good day. Uh, you know, that w w whatever the case, sometimes here, sometimes here's an extreme people go to as well. they will be like, you know what? I saw this one case and this person left and I don't think they really got saved. So I'm just not going to preach the gospel to anybody anymore. I'm just going to put tracks on doors. You ever seen somebody that does that? I'm just going to put tracks on doors and just let the Holy Spirit just take that track and, 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 and do whatever. And they're like, I'm just not going to give the gospel anymore. All right. Or I'm just going to invite folks to church. And when they come to church, our pastor can preach the gospel and then they can get saved. And then they just rely on the altar calls. And there's no push for it. personal evangelism. People go out knocking doors or whatever. Uh, they just, they, they, they go to this extreme. Like, we won't preach the gospel. We'll just do this. Or you get these guys that are like street preachers and they're standing out in the road and they got the signs, turn or burn. And they got all this and they got mega phones, whatever. And they're like, you know, preaching against their sin, looking for somebody who looks like they're doing something wicked and just starts preaching against their sin. And, uh, and, and, and they, they do that. They do that. And they, they'll, they'll draw crowds. And then these crowds will like start 
heckling them and stuff like that. And they'll make YouTube videos and all that stuff. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I don't know what their ultimate motivation is. But here's what I know. Which one's more dangerous? Like just going out and just preaching the gospel. And maybe, you know, you thought they got saved, you know, but they didn't really get saved. But you just preached, hey, it's not your works. It's just believing in Jesus Christ. What if that's it? What if you just walked around and said, hey, you know, if you're going to heaven, well, hey, it's, just, it's not by your works. It's just by Jesus Christ, right? Okay, yeah, right, amen, amen. And you go to the next door and you say the same thing, whatever. And you, you take that side, you know, are you preaching damnable heresy? No, maybe people aren't really getting saved, right? But you're not preaching damnable heresy. You're just telling them, hey, Jesus saves. You've seen shirts that say Jesus saves. That's pretty basic, right? But the other extreme where you're saying, hey, you know, you're a sinner and you, if you don't feel right, if you don't really feel that sorrow and, and you're not turning and, and if, you're, if you wake up and nothing changed and you're not a different person and all that kind of stuff, then you weren't really saved. And, and, and that's all you're leaving people with. And you're like, well, I'm not going to give them any closure to this because I don't know if they're saved or not. What are you waiting for them to look like you? You know, are you waiting for, <laughs> you're waiting for this ideal per person and that's. Well, now what you're doing is you're creating this situation where these people feel like, well, I don't think I can get saved unless I look like that, unless I change, unless I believe that. And that's a works-based salvation that's going to lead people to hell. Amen. Now, which is a more dangerous path? <laughs> you know, Teaching a works-based salvation is always going to be the more dangerous path. Teaching an easy believism is not really dangerous. And I don't understand why everybody's always like, you're making people twofold the child of hell. I've heard that so many times. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? If they were lost already and I told them, hey, whatever you're trusting in, you need to stop trusting that, trust in Jesus. Who cares if I pronounce them saved or not, which I'm not going to do, you know, but ultimately, did I really do anything heretical or, or cause them to, you know, to die? Did I destroy them? No. I just ran off the road, maybe. Maybe I was kind of sloppy. Maybe I didn't give them a really clear plan of salvation. Maybe, maybe they didn't really get saved, but you know what? Everybody's still alive. <laughs> Nobody, you know, nobody's uh, uh, gone down the road of damnable heresy. And so, you know, I believe that when it comes to preaching the gospel, it's really not... It's really not a difficult thing. You know, it's something that a little kid can learn how to do. Uh, you say, hey, well, are the people really getting saved? Well, that's really not the issue. The issue is, are they going out and they preach? I mean, the blind man gets his sight, has no idea who Jesus is. He's like, you know what? I don't really know about all you thing you Pharisees are talking about. I don't know what all the Christians are talking about. All I know is that I was, I was blind and now I see, <laughs> right? You know what? That's, that's witnessing. That's giving the gospel, saying, hey, all I know is I was lost. I put my faith in Jesus Christ, and now I'm going to heaven, right? I mean, hey, there's nothing wrong. Go, I, I, would, I would be happy if everybody did that. You know, <laughs> just knock on your neighbor's door. And, and if you just said that much, praise the Lord, you went out there and you were a witness for the Lord. <clears throat> Look how easy it is. Acts chapter 16. Now, as we mature as Christians and as we grow in knowledge of the Lord and of His Word, and, uh, you know, we might get to a point, you don't ever want to make it too complicated, but we might get to a point where, hey, I could share this verse, I can explain this a little bit better. I find that when I give the gospel, these people are always tripped up here. And there's things that you learn through experience. Uh, we see that with, with uh, you know, different guys. I've learned a lot by going soul winning with different guys in this work and different verses that somebody might be led to. And I'm like, oh, I never thought about that verse. And, and this is just experience, going out and soul winning. This is why it's so good that you get involved in that because you are going to learn and you are going to grow. But just going out and doing it to begin with, you're not hurting anything. If you know how to be saved and you go out and preach the simplicity of the gospel, you're not causing any harm. Look at Acts chapter 16, verse 30. And this is about the jailer, you know, and Paul and Silas and the jailer says he brought him out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I mean, it makes sense. There's a lot of gospel tracts that start with that because like really if you want to know how to be saved and you turn to the Bible and it says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Whatever follows is probably going to tell you how to get saved, don't you think? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Well, that's an easy believism right there. 
Now, I don't know what else, because he goes on and he spake to him the word of the Lord and all that were in his house. So he went on and preached to them some more things. But you know what? I, I do not believe that he preached was, well, I'll tell you what, you know what? Yeah, let me, let me just get a list of all the sins that you've done. And if you'll just turn from those sins and you'll stop doing those sins, you know what I mean? And, and that's not what he did. He obviously preached Jesus Christ and he obviously showed him that Jesus Christ came and, and he was, he, he, here's what the Bible said about it. This guy's a Roman. He's not a, like a Jew. And so here's another thing. You go to a culture where they're like, well, these guys, they don't know the Bible. They've never read that. You need to, you need to build a relationship with them and like a month later, maybe give them the gospel. But, but your goal between now and then is to get them familiar with the Bible and all that. Where do you find that in the Bible? <laughs> this guy walks up to a, to a Roman, you know, other places. He goes to uh, Ephesus or uh, no, let's see. He goes to Athens and he's talking to these idolaters that believe all this weird stuff. And he goes straight to the gospel, says, this is Jesus Christ. Believe in him and you can be saved. That's it. <laughs> right? He didn't have to have a 12-week course, 30-day, you know, uh, let's get to know each other. And then I'll preach to you the gospel. For one thing, they could die. And, you know, someone will say like, well, God wouldn't let that happen. Well, I mean, people are going to die sometime. You know, so now is the day of salvation. So go preach the gospel whenever you have the chance. A lot of missionaries need to learn that lesson. Acts, uh, Acts chapter 8. Acts 8 verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of uh, Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit saith unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some uh, some men show uh, some sorry some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he should come he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scriptures which he read was this: He was led to the sheep of, to the slaughter, led as a sleep sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before a shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humility, his judgment was taken away. And who should declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began uh, at, the, at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See here is me to be baptized. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, he said, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down uh, both into the water, both Philip and the e eunuch, and he baptized him. Now I'm sure some independent fundamental Baptist somewhere is going to say, Now wait a minute, that's easy professism. That's easy believism right there. I mean, he just said, all you got to do is believe. And he said, I believe with all my heart. Wait a minute now. I didn't see any fruit. What are you doing baptizing that guy? We got to wait and see if he bears some fruit. You know, John the Baptist said, bring forth fruits, meet for repentance. And so we got to wait for some fruit. That's not what he says. He just preached to him, Jesus. Hey, that verse you're reading about, that's Jesus. Jesus was the lamb that was slain. And I don't know what the message that he gave to him. I don't know what his, his presentation sounded like. But I know this, he didn't teach him about turning from his sins and cleaning up his life and having all the sorrow inside his heart and all this. Kind of stuff. He preached to him, Jesus. And then he said, what hinders me from being baptized? He didn't say, well, if you really changed your mind about your sin, if you really, you know, if you don't want to sin anymore, you ever heard that one? Like, well, you don't have to turn from your sin. You just got to not want to sin anymore. Well, then <laughs> you're going to tell me you never wanted to sin. <laughs> you know, the moment you got saved, you're just like, all right, at this moment, I don't want to sin. Okay, now I want to sin, but I got saved a minute ago. I mean, because you're always, your flesh, you always have this flesh that's going to want to do sin. And so who draws that line between why, what sin you have to confess, what sin you have to, no, you, what you're doing is you're confessing Christ. You're professing him. 
You're confessing that He is my Savior. He died for the sins that I deserve to die for, but He did it. And once you do that and you realize that and you believe that in your heart and you accept that, look, I can't see a man's heart. But Philip said, hey, if you believe with all your heart, he said, yeah, I believe with all my heart. All right, let's get baptized. He probably, after that, went back to uh, Jerusalem. He said, ah, one more salvation to write up on the wall. <laughs> Prideful, right? Keeping track of how many numbers he got, of people he got saved. What? Well, it's recorded in Acts, isn't it? The Bible compares salvation to drinking water. Is that difficult? <laughs> Here's water. You have to believe that you're thirsty, right? You need to believe that this is going to quench your thirst and drink it, all right? I don't know what that's going to do. Is that going to, you know, I can't see what's going on in your stomach or anything like that, but it's drinking water. Jesus himself used the analogy of eating bread and drinking water. Eating bread, you know, I'm the bread of life. The disciples say, oh, we got to eat you? That's, that's gross. The Catholic Church today says, we got to eat your body? Okay, we got to eat your body. That's not what he says. He's just saying, believe in me. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. The work of my Father is this, that you believe on him who, uh, who he, uh, believe on me whom he has sent. Okay? And so uh, I think we understand. I think everyone's on the same page. But my point is just be careful should you ever, you know, think, well, I'm just not so sure about this. Or you know somebody maybe who, you know, they, they like, I don't know, I went out with those guys, they sure made it look too easy, they're too quick to write numbers on the board or whatever. Be careful because you might easily be slipping into a point where you're going to go right off the cliff into lordship salvation or workspace salvation. And you know what? I believe some of those people are saved, but they got so disgruntled and so like uh, disillusioned, you know, and some guys just like, hey, I've been doing this for 20 years. And you know, how come the church hasn't exploded and there's not a lot of people here? How come these people that are claiming to be saved and they never see the fruit and they don't, you know, they don't really seem to, uh, you know, be just giving their life to the Lord and all that kind of stuff. And they're like, so I guess I need to just start preaching workspace salvation. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make any sense. You would think like, well, they can't be saved if they're doing that. I believe they're saved. I think they're just, they just get messed up by indoctrination or just, you know, uh, they get, you know, bitter and stuff like that. And there's different reasons why people will fall off to the other extreme. But there's a ditch on both sides. Number two, a church's philosophy of ministry or I could say methodology, all right? So some people label it like this. And again, I, I, I hate using terms because they just mean whatever you define them to mean, you know? And so, you know, lordship, salvation, uh, easy believism, like we, we got to know what you mean by that <laughs> or else, or, you know. So the same is true with methodology, but a lot of people use these words. They say legalist or liberal, right? And all I know is my whole life, I never wanted to be called a liberal. <laughs> I just knew that was bad. Whatever that even means, it's bad. I don't want to be a liberal, right? But I don't want to be a legalist either. But what is a legalist, right? So some people say, well, legalism is actually has to, do, has to do with people that are believing in work salvation. Like you're believing that you have to keep the law, right? That's why it's legal, legalism. You have to keep the law in order to be saved. But that's not usually what people mean. What people mean is, hey, these people, all they want to do is, you know, talk about their rules and you got to do this and you got to keep this. And, and it might not even be based on salvation, but they're just saying you got to have all these rules and, and these laws. And, and they say these people are legalists, all right? And on the other side of the road is another ditch called liberalism. And liberalism sounds good too because we certainly as Christians have liberality, right? But we got to be super careful that we don't use that liberality, right, for an occasion to cause people to stumble and what have you. So what do we mean by liberalism? Well, again, it depends on how you define it because liberalism can mean that word can actually being liberal could actually mean you don't believe in the Bible at all. Like you don't believe in the virgin birth. You don't believe in, in all this. I mean, those people that talk about Christians who are liberals, what it really means is they don't believe the Bible. <laughs> all right. But what we mean typically when we say liberal is somebody who, uh, you know, they just start going to other like non-denominational. And I've said this before, but 
I'm okay with non-denominational. Like, if, if there's no denominational, praise the Lord, because I don't even think Baptists should be a, de a denomination. I think we should all just be independent churches. But when they say non-denominational church, what that really is is an interdenominational church, which means you bring whatever belief you want into this, and you, you're welcome to come. We're not going to preach on that because we don't want to offend you. And that, that's usually what it becomes. So to me, that's what liberalism is. It's just like, hey, we're not going to preach against that. You know, you can, whatever methodology you want, you can come in, you can bring that. We're not going to judge. We're not going to. Uh, do. Now, look, I believe that there are ditches on both sides of that road. Right now, I can't tell you exactly where we're supposed to line up, what the, what is on that road on the Christian life. I can read the Bible and I can do my best and I can say, hey, this is what we're going to do. And we're not going to allow that. And and, uh, and and but here's what here's what I know is that if if we have some really strong standards, this is what we believe is pleasing to the Lord, and this is what we want to do, and then we work together with someone that doesn't have those standards, there's going to be some kind of conflict there. And so Amos 3.3, and I'm not saying that this is the actual context of that verse, but the principle of what he's saying, it just makes sense. He says, can two walk together except they be agreed? <laughs> and that's just a blanket statement he's saying like, hey, you can't, it's kind of like being un unequally yoked. I'm not talking about unequally yoked with a non-believer, but but the idea, like, you know, the, the, in the Old Testament, one of the, the laws in the Old Testament said that you cannot yoke up an oxen with a donkey, right, with an ass. You take the donkey, uh, I mean, the, the oxen, this big old strong creature, and then you put it on the donkey, and you're going to have two different rates of speed. <laughs> you know what I mean? This person's going, you know, and it's just one's going to slow down the other, and, and it's just not going to work out. So you get the oxen, you oak up an oxen with an oxen, and then they'll get more work done, and they'll be uh, synchronized, and they'll be able to do everything better because they're in agreement. Now, how closely in agreement do you have to be? Obviously, you can start splitting hairs over that, but, uh, and, and there you go, there's the, the ditch on both sides. You can become a legalist, right? Or you can become so liberal that you just say, hey, we're going to tolerate everybody, and, you know, hey, we, you know, we don't mind who the members of the church are. We don't mind who we fellowship with, who we go out and we work with, and all that. And I think you can go way too far in that way. Look at 1 Corinthians 5.11. Let me tell you two groups of people that we don't want to unite with. Okay, when it comes to membership and accepting people in, and, and, and you know, they might come in a time or two, uh, you know, maybe we get to know them a little bit better as time goes. But uh, when they f when they first come in, we don't know a whole lot about them. So there does come a time when you find out more about some people, and there's some times where you have to make a decision. Well, there's two things that I want to make sure in our church that we don't have in our membership, and one is we don't want to have any members who are going to be threats to our families that are already here in the church. Okay, now. Sometimes you don't know that right away, and so you got to be careful. You got to you got to have a security guard. Everybody's got to be packing if they can, <laughs> right? We got to have an eye out on the parking lot because you never really know at the end of the day. But if we do know that somebody's a danger to people or somebody is harassing in various ways, that could be physical, it could be emotional or whatever, we don't want them here, right? If we have people that are involved in certain sins, and the Bible spells them out. Right, some of the unnatural type sins, unnatural affections people can have, and uh, and if they come in and we recognize this person, you know, fits the profile of having unnatural affections, we don't want them around our children. That's scary. That's dangerous. Right? Well, you just need to preach Christ to them. Well, if you want to do that, go preach Christ to them at their house. You know, there's plenty of churches in this area that would take them. You know, we don't want them because they're a harm to our children. That you say, well, no, 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 you're just Hey, I would rather go on that close to that, that ditch, if that's a ditch, <laughs> I mean, than to go the other way and just invite everybody in here. Next thing you know, they're perverting the kids and they're, and they're you know, uh, uh, abusing them. And if you don't think that goes on in churches, you're naive and you've never picked up a paper because independent fundamental Baptist churches are getting shut down all the time and accused all the time of people who got in to the church. Next thing you know, they're working in the children's ministries. Next thing you know, they're messing with children. And, uh, and we, we won't have it. We don't want also people who God tells us to cast out of the church. All right. Now, again, 
a person just gets saved, or maybe they're not even saved, but they come into the church. We understand that, and uh, we would never rec- we would never try to, you know, f- have somebody fill out an application at the door before they can come in. <laughs> That's not what we're about, right? Uh, but First Corinthians five, and we this is not really probably new to very many people in here, but this is a passage of scripture that's often overlooked when it comes to uh, people trying to build the church and have plenty of members in their church. And and what they don't realize is that Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that there are people that we have to remove from the assembly. Okay, now, there are people, now the, the first group I talked about, the ones who are a threat to children or to our families or they have reason reason for us to believe that they're a threat. You know, and let me just say, say this way. Somebody could do something to me, I can forgive them. Hey, I, you know what? I choose to forgive you. You're not really hurting me. You said something, you know, that I didn't like, but I can let that go, Right. But here's where they cross the line. If, if I, as the pastor, have to make a decision on behalf of the other people in the church, and there's a person who is, you know, doing things that I don't approve of verbally or whatever to other members in the church, I've got to come to this point where I say, you know what, I can forgive you for anything you did to me, but I don't have a right to say, you know what, I forgive you for everybody else in the church. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Because that, that's not fair. You know, you don't know what he's, what harm he's doing to other people. He or she is doing to other people in the church. And so you don't have that right to just be like, you know, we're going to forgive this person. We're going to overlook their mistakes and we're just going to let them in. You know, so we can't really do that. We, I have to make certain judgments and say this person is, a harm, is, is harmful to our group. But then there are some people that are involved in sins that don't really necessarily deal with our congregation. And they might have to be kicked out because they're not, uh, getting rid of some things in their life. But our hope would be that they would get right, they would repent, and they would come back. And, and there's no reason to not trust, the, you, know, the, the, you know, not to think that they're going to harm anybody in the church or anything. Let me show you what I mean. 1 Corinthians uh, 5. <clears throat> so he begins talking about this person who is living in fornication in their church. And, uh, and it says, you know, he's... he's uh, it's reported commonly that there's fornication among you and such fornication as is not such as named among the Gentiles. He's like, you don't even see this just out in the world. Like the, this is even, this is even for the world standards. He says that one, and it doesn't mean his mother or it would say mother. Okay. This means his father, you know, had either remarried or maybe he had two wives or, or maybe he married and then divorced her or whatever the case was. And then uh, this guy, hooked up with that ex-wife or that or that wife, whatever the case. It's, it's, it's a weird situation, however you look at it. It says, you are puffed up. He talked to the whole assembly and he says, you puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. It's like I almost look at our society today and be like, man, that's pretty lightweight <laughs> compared to some of the stuff that's going on in churches today. You know what I mean? Unfortunately. Now there's wicked stuff going on in the Bible days. I don't mean that our society is... It's more wicked now than it was in Paul's day. If you think that's the case, you haven't read about the types of things that were going on in that day. <clears throat> but there are some things that are accepted in the church that are that are filthy and disgusting, you know, today in churches. And he says, "You're puffed up that you not, not uh, you haven't mourned and, and removed this person from from among you." For I verily as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath not, uh, has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye have gathered together in my spirit with the, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And he keeps on going on, hey, your glorying is not good. And he's saying, purge out the old 11, verse 7. Uh, verse 7. And look at verse 12, he says, I mean, verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is a brother, and he makes it very clear in this passage, we're not talking about on the workforce, in the world, 
somebody who's involved in these things, you can't get around that. You, we live in this world. We, people are people. Sinners are sinners. But we're talking about in the church, people inside the church that you're, they're supposed to be learning and growing and encouraging one another, edifying one another. He says, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one, no, not to eat. See, these are people that are living in a sin and you want them, you love them and you care for them and you don't want them to fall farther or to keep, keep sinning or to be a bad influence on everybody else, you know, that might say, oh, there's nothing wrong with doing that. And then they do it. So the idea is, hey, if they're not going to repent of that, you kick them out of the assembly until they're ready to repent of that, come back and, and have a different attitude about that so that the whole uh, lump isn't leavened, okay? So you got to, uh, so he's saying it's for the good of them that you do that. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? I thought Matthew 7 said, do not judge. <laughs> but them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. You, uh, we as a church, he's saying you as a, to a whole assembly, we as a church have the right and in fact the, uh, the command to remove certain people from the assembly for their own good and for the, and for the good of the whole uh, congregation. All right, so we want to be very careful in our ministry as a church here that we don't just open the doors and just, yeah, come on in. We forgive everybody. Come as you are, you know, and uh, leave as you are. <laughs> and, you know, we're not, we're not worried about it. You know, we're all just sinners and a sin is a sin, right? Well, that's not what it says here because <laughs> everybody's a sinner, but not everybody's commanded to be kicked out of a church for certain sins. Right. So so we have a right to, to judge and to make sure that uh, people are doing things a certain way. All right. Real quick. Like, this one will be this one. I'll shorten up a little bit. OK, so here's another uh, here's another example of a ditch on both sides. OK, maybe uh, one word to one way to describe this would be our public image, you know, a public image of, uh, you know, how people perceive you. Are you a nice guy? You know, are you a mean guy? And so here's the thing that I see a lot is there's in the ministry when it comes to preaching, right? Because preaching is reprove, rebuke, exhort, right? And so what does that look like? Some people rebuke and it comes off really, really harsh. Some people rebuke and it's just like, you know, hitting somebody with a wet noodle. Like it really doesn't do anything, <laughs> right? So how do we, what is that image? What, was that, what does that look like? What's a, when is a preacher too rough of a preacher, too mean of a preacher? And when is a preacher too soft, too kind, too nice, right? I believe there are uh, ditches on both sides of that road. You know, how, what are we supposed to look like? I, I, uh, I don't remember if I mentioned this here or not, but I, on Facebook a while back, I came across a friend uh, from, uh, from Bible college days who, who seems to progressively be getting softer and softer on areas like King James and areas of, uh, you know, methodology when it comes to uh, music or, or uh, sta just various standards or whatever that we once all held to as independent fundamental Baptists. Uh, again, independent fundamental uh, emphasis on the independent. So I don't care if a church uh, is different, slightly different standards than another person. But from my understanding, my, my watching this, there's just a digression, you know what I mean, in this guy, uh, this guy's ministry. And I'm reading this, his Facebook post, and it's the month of June. And so he makes this post. I should have probably brought it to read it to you. but And he makes this post, and he's like, now, it's the month of June. And so you're going to see a lot of posts from the LGBT community and the pride this and the pride that. And he's like, now, I'm a Christian, and I'm against these things. He's like, but... Don't forget that there's a person behind every single one of these. And whenever you see that, hey, you should expect the world to be like the world. And hey, don't you get too mean. Don't be a jerk. And he's like, come on, guys, don't mess this up and show the love of Christ and all this kind of stuff. Now, I know on the surface what he meant by that. And a lot of my Christian friends like that because they're saying, oh, yeah. I got a lot of Christian friends, okay? You're thinking, which friends? Because there's another group of friends that I have that would not, <laughs> they would have made a meme about that guy by now. <clears throat> 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 
But I'm like saying, hey, man, there's a ditch on both sides of the road, but but you're being too nice because this is not the time in our society in the month of June that Christians need to be like, you know what? We just love everybody. Come on in. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is something that is affecting our society more than you can ever imagine. It's worse than you probably think that it is. I mean, every time I find out how bad it is, I just, I'm shocked. And man, some of you might know this, but I watched Blue's Clues. <laughs> I don't watch Blue's Clues. But I saw a Blue's Clues episode during Gay Pride Month. Do you know what Blue's, you know what Blue's Clues audience is? Maybe two, three? I mean, what? How, how young are they? I don't know. And there's a guy, uh, if you want to call him that, a guy... He's a cartoon character, but it's the person that's playing this cartoon character is actually one of those guys that does the the drag queen story time in the libraries and just a sicko. And he is the the picture that's on this Blue's Clues cartoon. I looked this up. It's from the Blue's Clues YouTube page, and I watched the video they put out because I did not want to believe it. I was like, somebody made this up. There's no way. <clears throat> in this drag queen story time, whatever... A freak is there saying, uh, I don't even want to start saying it because it'd probably be in your head. <laughs> but he's just glorifying like, hey, so-and-so has two mommies and blah, 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 blah. And I mean, he uses the word, uh, they have non-binary parents and, and they're going through all these like letters of the alphabet, you know, and describing these things that two and three-year-olds wouldn't have any idea what that means or care about it anyway. Wait. But they're letting this guy, uh, uh, they're, they're letting... You know, who, who's letting them? Well, you got PBS. I guess PBS is behind it. I don't know. You got the makers of Blue's Clues. You got parents who sit the kids down in front of the TV and don't watch. You got uh, you got the pay, the people who are paying. You know, all, I mean, there's, there's so many people involved. But what it comes down to is our society. Now, last year, you know what it was? Arthur. Remember Arthur? What is he? Anybody remember what he is? I don't even know what he is. I forget. Is he Ar Ardvark? He's an Ardvark. She knew. <laughs> you had to point. It wasn't me. I don't know. I don't know. Who she said Aardvark. <laughs> Arthur. My kids watch. I let my kids watch that whenever they were little. I thought it was. Oh, Valerie says no. We didn't. <laughs> I thought they watched Arthur. It must have been something else. <clears throat> yeah, a little Aardvark. You know. <laughs> I guess ant eater or something. And uh, all these little animals. Somebody said on that Blues Clues parade. These are all animals, by the way. The two moms are two animals. The two dogs are two animals. And someone said, isn't that fitting? An animal parade, you know, coming across. That's what the Bible says, by the way. If you, know, if you think that's rough, the Bible calls them beasts. Okay, so, so, uh, so where was I going? So Arthur, last year, they just nonchalantly, just like no warning about it or anything, they threw in this episode where uh, all the kids, they don't understand what's going on, but they're with their teacher, but their teacher's getting married. And, and I don't remember the whole story, but the, the story, but at the very end, surprise, surprise, the male teacher is marrying another man and they just act like, Oh, no big deal. Right. And it's just like, well, they're, they're, they're trying to get to the children, the young people in our society. And by the way, your children are trying to get to them. They're trying to pervert their minds and think, Oh, this is all okay. And you think now is time for Christians to be like, oh, yeah, it's no big deal. The world's going to be the world. Well, okay, yes, the world's going to be the world, but we're trying to run a church and raise families here and live in a country that hopefully is not going to be Sodom and Gomorrah, but I'm afraid that we're almost past that line. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so we've got to be very, very careful not to just allow and embrace these things. So, yes, sometimes the public image of a pastor speaking on these things comes up, comes across as being rough and hard, you know, and I, I, I don't have to preach on the LGBT, you know, the only reason I would preach that, let's be honest, the only reason I would preach that here at Kansas City, KC Mission is to get a bunch of amens and to get people pumped up and worked up, right? I mean, because everybody here is on the same page, I think, on that subject. But in Iola, you know, I've got some, we've got some new people there. And if you don't know this about Iola, Iola is, if you have children in public school in Iola, they're going to be brainwashed about this stuff and they're going to come out 
We're very desensitized to some of the garbage that's going on in our society. And so we've dealt with children's ministries there in Iola for a while, and we've had a lot of uh, people confused on gender and all this stuff. And so it's perfect opportunity this month, and the Lord has given me very, uh, I think, liberty uh, to be able to do this. I'm going to preach through the Bible. It's going to go beyond June, I would suspect, but I preach a series on just sexual degeneration and all in the Bible. Uh, what the Bible says about the, these uh, these things. Uh, what did I say? Sexual degeneration. What is the word I'm looking for? Sexual deviation. Okay. So I looked up sexual deviation. I was looking for a definition of sex, sexual deviation. And I kid you not, it said it used to be called sexual deviation. But now it's called let's see, paraphilia. Paraphilia. Other than uh, <laughs> philia, you know what I mean? Like. If, we, if I said pedophilia, you would, th- you would know what I mean, right? So paraphilia means something other than what is normal, right, on that. But we don't want to say sexual, uh, uh, what was the word I used again? Sexual deviation, because that implies that these people are, are deviating. Well, guess what? That's what paraphilia means too. <laughs> but they're trying everything they can to soft it and make it seem normal. But I kid you not, you try to look that up on Google, sexual deviation, they're like, oh, we don't say that anymore. You know, now it's paraphilia because they're trying to make it sound normal. They don't want anybody to be thought of as somebody who, you know, and and how far does that go? There are people doing stuff with animals. There are people doing stuff with inanimate objects and wanting to marry them and stuff like that. At what point does our society say, look, no, that's not okay. I mean, you got a third world country. You got people, you got leaders in Africa saying you Americans are dumb if you think that this is right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and yet Americans just be like, no, no, we got to be nice. Well, look, now's not the time for Baptist preachers to just be like super soft on this stuff. Yeah. Now more than ever, we need to be able to speak out on those kinds of things. So let me give you real quickly. I don't even know what time it is, but I feel like I'm going long. Look at Matthew 3. Matthew 3, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The same John had his raiment uh, uh, raiment of camel's hair and leathern girdles uh, about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Uh, then went out, uh, out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. <clears throat> I wish I could get off on and, and preach on the context of this for a while, but I'm not going to. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees came to his baptism, he said unto them, all right, now all the, so I, I have to get off just a little bit so you understand. <clears throat> I was trying to, to not do it, but I can't help it. It was like uh, the fire within my bones and I couldn't shut up. <laughs> okay, so uh, so you say, oh, look, look, he's preaching repentance, right? Oh, he's preaching, all these come, they're confessing their sins. Yeah, they're also, they're also Jews, God's people. He's talking about, these are God's people. And he's saying, hey, prepare you for the Lord. He's here, the Messiah has come. And a lot of these people are going to turn to the Lord and they're going to believe in him because they were already believers. If they would have died before they met Jesus... They were already saved. They had faith in the in what had been revealed to them in the Old Testament, right? It was, they didn't get saved any way differently in the Old Testament than they do in the New Testament, okay? But then he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now that's a different story. These guys were making up laws and they they were, you know, they were not true believers, all right? And he saw them and they came to his baptism and he said to them, Oh, generation of vipers. Oh, I'm sorry, he probably said, You generation of of, of vipers, excuse my English. <laughs> <laughs> who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come bring forth therefore fruit meat for repentance and think not to say within yourself we have Abraham to our father for I say unto you that God is able to these stones to raise up children of Abraham let, let me just summarize this John the Baptist gets his head cut off because he, t- he, he preaches against the, to the, uh, the king and tells him that what he's doing is wicked he's not supposed to have his brother Philip's wife and he preaches and I actually shared that with that guy that had that Facebook post about how we're supposed to be nice. I don't remember how it came up exactly, but I ended up sharing that idea. And he said, well, 
he didn't necessarily say that mean. All we know is that he told Herod that he wasn't supposed to have his brother's wife. He didn't say it mean. And I'm thinking, which, have you read John the Baptist? You think really he was just like, now Herod. <laughs> oh, majesty, king, great one. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think so. I think he... I think he probably seemed pretty mean. He seemed like a rough guy. I mean, he lived off honey and locusts for Pete's sake. I mean, <laughs> Jesus said this, and I got to I got to close here. But I also shared this first. All right, okay. Because because why am I so mad about the LGBT and the Pride Month and all that? I already I think I made it clear. What I'm most mad about. I understand the world's the world. They're going to do some wicked things. But even still, there are murderers out there. There are all kind of wicked things. That I, I don't think that we should just be like, well, you know, they're not saved, so they're just going to do whatever they want to do. No, there's, there's, we still have to preach against it. We still have to try to stop, stop it from happening. But when they're trying to inf infiltrate children, and when the society is going after children, and I see people coming out of elementary school, understanding things and saying things that, oh, I didn't, I didn't even know what, I didn't even know what binary, uh, non-binary meant till like last year <laughs> or something, maybe a little bit earlier than that. I didn't know what these words meant, all these pronouns that you're supposed to come up with to, you know, what is your proper pronoun? I thought it was he or she, <laughs> right? But uh, no, apparently there's more. <laughs> and so like they're, but they're teaching the children and I get upset about that. Well, here's what Jesus said in Luke 7 too. <clears throat> it were better for him to have a millstone were hung around his neck Sorry, let me read it again. It were better for him that a millstone were hung about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. I mean, Jesus said, you know what you ought to do with those guys? <laughs> or actually what he said was, actually that would be light. If you tied a millstone around his neck, threw him in the, in the sea, that's, that's light compared to what he really needs, you know, what he's really got coming to him. No, but I'm sure he was really not soft and he was really nice about it. He wasn't a jerk, right? He didn't want to be a jerk. No, look, people, <laughs> there, there are ditches on both sides because there is a way preachers can come across sometimes that is jerky and is mean and is rude and is unnecessary uh, uh, rudeness <laughs> to people who aren't, who, who aren't really a threat. You know what I mean? But there is a time to stand up. There's a time to call things what they are and to be honest about it. And you can speak the truth in love and it can still come across as tough love, but it is the truth and it has to be preached. There's a lot in the Bible about being meek and peaceable and forgiving and showing mercy. And, uh, and so, you know, there are two ditches on both sides of the road here. But basically, you get the idea of the message. There's a ditch on both sides of the road. That doesn't mean that we're looking for, you know, what I've always heard it called is like uh, straddling the fence, right? Like I'm trying to make everybody happy. You know, I, I, I sometimes talk about, you know, I preach a message on diplomacy. And, and, and like sometimes it looks like, hey, I'm trying to preach the, the, the biblical message. Try as much as lieth within you, be peaceable to all men, right? We should try to live in peace, right? And so sometimes it could come across like I'm saying, hey, just... Follow the easy road and don't get any drama and all that. No, I realize drama is going to come. Tri tribulation is going to come. Persecution is going to come. I realize that. But what I want to do is I want to stay on the road and not be just like, you know what? I'm going to go in the ditch or I'm falling into this ditch. Ah, let me swerve and end up in this ditch over here. I want to stay on the road. I want to follow the Lord, you know, the best of my ability and try to stay in that and not get off uh, on one side or the other. Let's pray. Father, uh, I pray you help us as a church and help me as a pastor um, to understand that we're not concerned about this ministry, what it looks like to the world. We're not even concerned about what this ministry looks like to other Christians, uh, but we're, we're concerned primarily about what it looks like to you. And we want to do right. We want to live right and follow the scripture as you've given us. And then also, Lord, uh, we just want one another here in this church, the members that are here and, and uh, those who are learning and growing as well as those who've been here for a long time and saved for a long time. Lord, we all want to be discipled together and to grow more and to produce more fruit for you. And so I pray that you'll help us not get distracted and not go off into the ditch and not become bitter and disillusioned by 
uh, by different things that would cause us to, to stop uh, making forward progression on the road that you've called us to. And whatever the actual application is, Lord, if I've gotten off from what the straight and the narrow way uh, is, Lord, uh, uh, forgive me for that, but we understand this principle is something all throughout the Bible. I believe there are uh, balances and there's uh, time to... A time to love and a time to hate. There's a time for all these different things as we see in Ecclesiastes. Lord, I pray you be glorified with all that we do. Guide us, direct us, give us that we might follow the Spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.